ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and the individual members of one another. Having then gifts deferring according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Our ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He, he who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. You may be seated. We began talking last week in connection with discipleship, the concept of the, um, the body and the importance of functioning as a body. It is important to all of us to recognize that we have an extremely important role to play as disciples of Christ. As we've looked at this idea of discipleship in Luke 9, 23, if anyone comes after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. We, we need to be devoted followers of Jesus. You know, it's one thing to wear the name. It's another thing to actually be a disciple. And, and we are called upon to be disciples. Now, as we looked last week at um, Colossians chapter 1, we noticed that Jesus is the head of the body, his church. We, as his body, look to him for our direction, just as your own human body looks to the head for its direction. In Ephesians chapter 1, we looked at the church, his body is the fullness of him. Just as we would think it a very strange thing to see a head without a body, Jesus, the fullness of him, are all of the members of the body. All of us. There's not an, an unimportant member of the body of Christ. Everyone is important and has a role to play in this thing called the body of Christ. And so we turned over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we took note of the fact that there, even though there's one body, there are many members, and one member can't look at another and say, well, you know, I'm not like you, so I guess I'm not a part of the body. I can't do this as well as you can, so I'm not a part of the body. Or, I'm better than you are, and that means you're not a part of the body. That's not how the body works. You know what happens in our, in our physical bodies when another part does that to another part? We become sick and we need help. When one part of our body either attacks or rejects another part of our body, we, we have a problem. And we have to go seek a medical attention, sometimes surgeries. Perhaps our bodies never fully recover from those things. Now imagine that in connection with the body of Christ. The body of Christ needs to be a fully functioning, following its head, body to be the fullness of him who fills all and is in all. You and I are called to be that. You say, well, Mark, you know, that, that sounds pretty neat, but how do we do that? That's what we want to talk about today. Would you pray with me, please? Our Father and our God in heaven, we thank you so much for the blessings of this precious day. And we thank you, Father, for giving us this opportunity to hear from you once again from your precious word. Guide our thoughts, Father, as we follow along with the things you have laid out for us. And strengthen us, Father, to bring these into practice in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Over to our scripture reading just a few moments ago, which Grayson uh, so capably read for us. Appreciate uh, today was, was kind of a, a neat day. I don't know how many of you paid attention, but we had uh, Keith on the table and Grayson followed him with the scripture reading. We had JP on the table and his son Christian up here at the same time. That, that's, 
Folks, we're building a legacy. We're building up our young people. And we're building them up so they can take over for us. Unfortunately, there have been times in the past in the church, and I've experienced those things, where the older don't want to let go of control and, and raise up the younger to fill their spots. Leadership is about filling in after you're gone. You don't leave a void. You leave those that can come in and fill in and, and then take it from that point forward. We don't want them starting from scratch when we're gone. We want them to pick up where we left it and move it even to greater heights. And so it was just, it was, to me, it was just very impressive to, to see fathers and sons together this morning. In Romans chapter 12, this particular letter has been very heavy on theology. The first 11 chapters, the Apostle Paul talks about Gentile Christians, Jewish Christians, and then all Christians and their relationship to each other through the idea of the sacrifice of Christ, through what came through Abraham, and all of these very deep theological things that take place in the book of Romans. And then he transitions here in chapter 12 into now that we know all of those things, here's what we need to do about it. This is how we put these things into practice. Beginning in verse 3, For I say through the grace given me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt with each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. I think we've read that somewhere before, haven't we? Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in, a, in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Now notice as he begins here, he says, to everyone who is among you. Who is he leaving out in the Roman church? He's not leaving any of them out. All of them need to, to see these things and find their place in the body of Christ. Well, I don't know what my gift is, Mark. Well, you need to find out what your gift is. And then you need to put it to work. Even though, you, well, you know, I, just, I can't really do anything. Yeah, you can. Everybody can. Everybody has something to offer to the body because as we read back in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians last week, God has placed each member of the body as he pleases. You are where you are because it pleased God to put you there. And so we have these things. And, and, and your, your gift or your contribution may evolve and change over the course of your Christianity. It probably should. You know, when you're first starting out, you've got all this energy and you don't know what to do with it. Kind of like a teenager, right? You know, they, I tell you what, if I had the energy today that I have when I was a teenager with what I know now, I would be dangerous. But I, I, I know all this stuff, and I can't do anything about it anymore. Just teasing. But the, the whole situation is you're, you've got all this energy, and then you learn, and you kind of slow down a little bit, so you pace yourself, and then as you start to wind down in your golden years, well, you can't do all the things you once could do. But you know, one of the things that you can do, and we're going to look at this in just a moment, you can exhort others to do what now you can't do. You can encourage them to, to fill in behind you, so to speak. We don't need voids in the body. All of the body needs to be filled to its proper place. All of the members... He says, do not have the same function. 
It would be confusion right now if 180 people were all preaching at the same time. Wouldn't you think? It would be kind of confusing. Especially if we were all preaching something different. We've got to take our particular place. Now, we've got a lot of people here capable of preaching. But we've got to do it one at a time. We can't do it all at the same time. We've got a lot of people here who can teach. But some of them are more gifted to teach younger and some are more gifted to teach older. We want them to teach. We, we all have a different function. Now, this word function has a very interesting definition. It is a deed or an action which is looked upon as either incomplete or in progress. So this function... We don't all have the same function, but we are functioning in a process. Something that hasn't been finished yet. Guess when it's going to be finished? When Christ returns. And since he hasn't come back yet, we're not finished. We're still progressing towards the time when it will be finished. We have a work to do. It is incomplete. It is incomplete until we hear that trumpet. And when we hear that trumpet, it's time to go home. But until then, we've got work to do. And so he begins by looking at prophesying. There are, there are seven things here. And this particular one is a little different than the rest because this could pertain either to the miraculous prophesying that existed in the first century where through the Holy Spirit they were speaking the words of God, or it could be in the non-miraculous sense of today of proclaiming or heralding God's word, speaking God's words for him, that is in a preaching capacity. So it is a proclamation of God's word, and it is not limited to an assembly like this. We can proclaim God's word anywhere. And there are many functions that take place when we prophesy or proclaim God's word. There, you know, the edification, the building up through the word of God. Exhortation, which we're going to look at here in just a few more minutes. Rebuking, that's when somebody is doing something opposed to God's word and you're bringing them into a right place and in line with what God's word teaches. Consolation. You know, there are many sorrows in this life. And God's word serves to console us on so many levels. Instruction. Tell us what we should, what we shouldn't do, how to keep on keeping on. There's so many uh, aspects of the proclaiming of God's word. Secondly... And now we're getting into all of these that are, that are not in the miraculous measure. Ministry. This word ministry here it is the same root form that we get deacon from. It means to be a servant or to minister. This is not talking about professional ministry, though it would encompass that. Ministry is serving in word or in deed. The same identical word in the same identical form appears in Acts chapter 6 when the uh, apostles decided that they shouldn't be waiting tables, serving tables. And they appointed others to do that. And so this idea of ministry is to serve in word or in deed. Jesus in Matthew chapter 20 helps us to see the importance of serving. Beginning in verse 29. Now as they went out of Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the road, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. Then the multitude warned them that they should be quiet, but they all cried out even more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. 
So Jesus stood still and called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? And they said, That our eyes may be open. So Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes, and immediately their, their eyes received sight, and they followed him. Jesus was a servant. He was one who served. Jesus' ministry was all-encompassing during those three-plus years that he was engaged in this activity leading up to the cross. And he didn't care if they were rich or poor. He didn't care if they were Jew or Gentile. He goes, the Syrophoenician woman comes to him. Now, he knows her heart, and he knows what he's going to do for her. But he tried to discourage her. And in the discouragement, she said, you know, even the dogs get to eat the crumbs that fall from the children's table. And Jesus says, I have not seen such great faith in all Israel. And he heals her daughter. It's, it's masterful service, masterful ministry coming from Jesus. Next, in teaching, we have a lot of different ways that we can teach. We can teach through our actions. We can teach uh, in a one-on-one -on -one or just a couple of people. We can teach in a classroom. We, we can teach in a lot of different ways, and there's a lot of different groups that can be taught. But let me tell you something. Jesus was a teacher. 46 times in the Gospels, it talks about Jesus taught, Jesus teaching, teaches, whatever, and all in those forms of the word to teach. Forty-six times Jesus was teaching. If we're going to be like Christ and he was a teacher, what do we need to be doing? We've got to teach. And teaching isn't about berating. Teaching is not about tearing people apart. Teaching is about helping them to get from point A to point Z. From where they are to where Christ desires for them to be. And we aid them along the way. Maybe it's just pointing out a Bible verse and saying, Hey, go read this and, and after you get, a, get some time, why don't you come talk to me about it? And let them read it. When they come back and say, Yeah, I read that, but it didn't make any sense to me. Or... Or what about this? Or what about that? Now there's a teaching moment that has come from that. We have some great teachers here at this congregation. Both men and women. And I think the most important teachers that we have are the ones that are teaching our children. Because they are filling in some of the gaps for us as parents in a very formalized setting that might bring to light things that we've tried to teach in an informal setting that might actually blossom. Maybe it's the teaching style. Maybe you can remember a teacher when you were uh, young, coming up in church, one that made a difference for you, that, that gave you some aha moments as you were growing up, and, and now all of a sudden the scripture started to make more sense. Teachers are important because when we're in the body, when we are teaching, we're following our master's example, who was the master teacher. We're taking his information that he shared with us, and we're sharing it with someone else. In exhorting, exhortation is to urge or to pursue some course of action. To urge or pursue some course of action. Now, when we do this in the body, when we are urging people to do things, we don't want to do it out of selfish motives. We want to do it out of sincere hearts, desiring that these people move to a better place in their lives. That they're, they're functioning as a husband or wife, as a child, as a parent, grandparent, as a brother or sister in Christ, whomever it may be, that they are functioning in a greater capacity to the glory of God. 
Exhortation. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verses 1 through 7. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but to holiness." You see there at the very opening, he's urging and exhorting. And he moves his way into this idea of sexual immorality and and the difficulties that come from engaging in those activities. And so here we are with an example of the Apostle Paul exhorting. When we want to urge someone onto greater conduct, to a better action in their lives, we have to know what we're talking about. Because it's not about your opinion. Because we all have got different opinions, and of course, mine are better than yours, but we're not talking about that right now. Isn't that the way we think? You know, our opinions are always better than everybody else's opinions, because if our opinions weren't better, we would have a different opinion. You can think about that on the way home. But, you know, it's not about forcing our opinions on others. It's about what God has said when we're exhorting someone to an action. And so when, when we're trying to help people get to a better place, we've got to have a foundation to stand on that's not going to crumble under our feet like our opinions do. We need to have the solid ground of God's Word behind us. In giving. Now, when we give, I have heard it said that we are never more like Jesus than when we give. We're never more like Jesus because Jesus gave everything. He gave it all. And so we in the body have gifts that we are given, and one of those gifts is giving. There are some people, and I don't know how they do it, I don't know their finances, but they don't appear to be wealthy individuals, who no matter what the occasion is, always have something to give. And they're always happy to give. It pleases them to share. I know that in in my ministry, I have seen it time and time again, And it mostly comes about as a result of an upcoming mission trip. It's like the the coffers of heaven just open up and people just pour out their money. You know, somebody will come to me and say, "Who, who needs some help raising some money that's going on your trip? They always have more than they need. I've I've never been pushing on a trip. And getting close to that time and scrambling around trying to find money for me to go or for somebody else to go with me. I've never had that problem because in the churches that I have served in, and this one is at the top of the game, the people have the gift of giving. And it is a beautiful thing. When we contribute to the needs of others, we're giving. This type of giving carries with it no ulterior motive not a hey you know don't you remember when I gave you that money kind of giving you know people like that you know they're they give and everything's good until they want to remind you about it later and then they've got something in mind right 
th- this is giving for the sake of giving. And you know, I've, I can't count the number of times people have come up to me and say, here, for what it, whatever needs you have while you're traveling or while you're, you're out of the country, here. You know, there's no motive behind that. It's just, here, whatever you need, take care of it. It, it, it is beautiful to see people give. When you think about giving, you know, Ephesians chapter 4, 28 is not talking about giving, but it is certainly talking about the result or how you get to the place where you can give. In encouraging the Ephesian Christians, the Apostle Paul writes, let, um, let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good. For what reason, Paul? Why should we work, Paul? That he may have something to give him who has need. Rather than taking from somebody else, now you're giving to someone that has a need. Over in Galatians, towards the close of the letter, verse 10, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. We have an opportunity to give, and and it's just amazing to me how giving this congregation is. Leading. This is an area where we're a little bit short in Puyallup. Leading, this word leading means to stand before or to lead or to rule over. And we've we're in need of, of some men to step up. This body needs help. It's not that our elders are not doing a good job. They are, but the congregation has grown beyond what four men can do. And every one of them will tell you the same thing. They need some help. And we're hoping this year to identify some individuals who can come alongside and help. We, we, need, we need deacons along with elders. We need people who are going to step up and take the lead in certain areas of ministry, whether it's with the the building, with the youth, with all of the things that we do. It's important for us to have people who can lead. A congregation a friend of mine preaches for in Texas, a congregation of about 450 people, folks, so about 200 more than we have on our roll. A couple of weeks ago, just added 25 deacons. Added. A lot of men stepped up in that congregation. A lot of men. I cannot even imagine the amount of work that now is going to get coordinated and, and headed up and get more people involved in. But leading is a very important aspect because God has appointed through Jesus Christ that there be human leaders in the church. Yes, Christ is our head, and our elders, our shepherds, appeal to the head for their direction as they lead. If they don't, then they're not leading the body of Christ, they're leading something else. But they make the appeal... To Christ. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, in verse 17, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those that labor in the word and doctrine. Those who preach and teach are worthy of double honor, he says. And over in the Hebrew letter, chapter 13, in verse 17, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. 
you can see that there's a responsibility on the leaders and a responsibility on the followers when it comes to those who lead. And it is our job as members to make the leaders' jobs easier, more bearable by taking the load to help them. Now, one of the things that that we struggle with here at Puyallup is we've got a lot of people that are in varying shades of introverts. Um, the Myers-Briggs, was it over 70% in the congregation, Bob? How many was it? Around 70%? The last time we took the, the personality test. So we got a lot of followers that aren't going to step up and volunteer. But the thing about an introvert is when you ask them to do something, they're usually one of your better workers. They just dive right in. And I found an article this week, and I sent it to our elders about how, how we've been going about it all wrong, getting people to work in the church. We need to be shoulder tapping. Go up, tap somebody on the shoulder and say, hey, can you help me with this? Teachers, you need somebody to help you? Do a shoulder tap. Deacons, you need some help? Do a shoulder tap. Recruit people. Because we'll make an announcement up here, we'll put it in the bulletin for a month, and we don't get one person to sign up. But I'm telling you, if you will go and tap somebody on the shoulder, they will jump at it. We need people to take the lead in their ministries and bring people into the fold and get them active in whatever area we are looking at. Lastly, with showing mercy. Mercy with cheerfulness. Mercy with cheerfulness. Sympathy that is manifested or revealed in an act. You know, it's one thing to say it, it's another thing to do something about it. We, we've got some, some folks that here that have got this one figured out pretty well, too. But, but some of us could probably learn to do better. Showing mercy. As we looked just a few moments ago at Jesus serving in healing the blind man, did you notice how he did it? with compassion that's mercy compassion for another helping and being cheerful about it there have been very few times in my life that I have volunteered to help someone that I didn't come away feeling probably more blessed than they were very few times because it is a blessing to help others, to serve others, and to provide their needs when they can't provide them for themselves. It is a blessing. As we turn to the previous two verses, to our text that we've looked at this morning, this is the transitional statement between the doctrinal and the practical session. Uh, sections here in the this letter to the Romans. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Paul is saying because of all of these things that we've talked about, all of these heavy doctrinal things, I'm pleading with you to put those things into practice. I'm pleading with you to give your body as a living sacrifice. Present it to God. You, you know what we've just been looking at in verses 3 through 8? 
how to be a living sacrifice. By prophesying, by ministering, by teaching, by exhorting, by leading, by giving, by showing mercy. That's how you're a living sacrifice. That's how you present yourself. A living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your reasonable service. Now, in some of your translations, it may say service of worship there. I want to talk to you for just a moment about this because uh, I, want to, I want to end on this with you. The word that is used there is a different word from the word worship in worship in spirit and truth. It's a different word in the original. Worship in spirit and in truth is the word proskuneo, which means to, to bow your head to the ground or to kiss towards the hand, to pay homage. The word here that is translated in the King James, reasonable service, or in your version, or a, a service of worship, is latreo which referred to the daily functions of the priest in the temple. When Jesus was told by Satan in the temptation, bow down and worship me and I'll give you all of these things, and he said, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. That's the same two words I've just told you about. Worship and serve is reasonable service or service of worship, depending on your translation. Jesus delineates between those two things in that verse. And the delineation here is this. As you worship in spirit and in truth here, you go outside of these doors to offer your body as a living sacrifice, as your reasonable service of worship. You see, Christianity is not just this. This is an important part of it. But Christianity is what do we do about it out there? How do we live out there? How do we function out there? Because discipleship requires that we sacrifice ourselves to the service of God. And we've got to put into practice the talents that we have to the glory of God. It doesn't matter how small you think your talent is, there's a place to put it to use in the kingdom, in the body, in the Lord's church. As disciples, we, we have work to do. We have to den deny ourselves, Jesus says in Luke 9, 23. Deny ourselves, take up our cross, daily take up self-denial daily and follow him that is put into practice the things that we know that we should do all the members of the body have a role to play and all of us functioning together can accomplish so much more than we ever can separately This morning, we talked about it last week. We'll talk about it again this week. Are you fulfilling your purpose in the body of Christ? Are there shortcomings for you? Uh, you would be dishonest probably to say that there aren't because we all have our shortcomings in our service. And there's always more that we can do. But if you've been especially uh, waiting on the sidelines... I'd like to encourage you this morning to recommit yourself to being a fully functioning member of the body. To putting into practice the things that you know that you can do and should do. And to do those things to the honor and the glory of God. If you're here today and and sins come back into your life, discouragement has become a part, maybe you're facing an illness, maybe there's a relationship I issue, uh, an economic issue, something that's going on, and you'd like our prayers, you'd like our encouragement today, allow us to serve you this morning in praying for you and encouraging you.
We're about to sing a song, and as this song is sung, we want to encourage you to come forward and express your need for prayer. We'll love to pray with you. Your brothers and sisters would love to come around you and encourage you this morning. Or if you happen to be here today and you've never named the name of Christ, you've never put him on in baptism, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? That's where it starts. You've got to believe that, that he came from the Father. He, he was born of Mary, a virgin, that he grew up, that he taught us how to live, that he showed us the Father through his life, that he went to the cross, that he died, that he was buried, that he was resurrected the third day, that he ascended to heaven, and that he is awaiting the Father's command to come and to take us home. Do you believe that? Are you willing to confess that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Turn from the sins in your life, the, the life that you thought you wanted to live, and turn to the cross. Repent. Embrace the sacrifice of Jesus. Change your mind about the way that you thought you should live and start thinking the way that he wants you to think. And then submit to being buried in water that is baptized for the remission of your sins. Our dear Father will apply the blood of Jesus to your soul. He will wash you clean. He will clothe you in Christ as you are raised to walk in a new life, a forgiven life, now one who has been uh, added to the body of Christ. Can we help you today? Make known to us today, at this very moment, your need as together we stand and sing.